Hi, I'm Dr. Pang. I speak as a private citizen. I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. I'm born and raised in Hawaii. I'm retired Army Medical Corps, 24 years. I was a um, researcher for Walter Reed Institute of Research for most of the time. My, my job was to, I'm a physician, test drugs and vaccines and diagnostics against tropical diseases. I was a consultant and loaned to the World Health Organization for 20 years before I retired and came back to Hawaii. I am on the America's Best Doctors list beginning in 2007. I'm a graduate of Princeton University. I uh, honors graduate in chemistry, but I had also four years of mathematics and physics. The people who take on this issue should study very well uh, the physics of dust, dust dispersion and why some dust does certain things and other particles of dust does not. The other thing you need to know to take on this issue is chemistry. There's quite a big difference in the chemistry between depleted uranium and depleted uranium oxide. When you burn or blow up uranium, it converts to depleted uranium oxide. So that's about all, all you need. Heavy dose of chemistry and some of physics. I am quite shocked over the last 15 years, the statements that come, have come out of the Army regarding the risk that their weapons have or don't have. They are not based in any physics that I knew. We have other PhDs who agree with me. We do not seem to agree too well with the military's position, although I am retired, Army Medical Corps. And there are some military PhDs, Doug Rocky, who are dissenting opinions to the mainstream military position. The other issue is the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. When they give a statement, before they give their statement, I would like to know the credentials. Okay, let's take a little step backwards and try to explain for the general public, see if we can understand what's going on. Uranium, it's kind of a common mineral. It's naturally radioactive. And that's the one you see people go mining for it and you try to detect it by Geiger counter. But when we take uranium that's been mined, you need to enrich it or deplete it. In other words, you take the raw material, you centrifuge it, and the centrifuge was split off according to the weight. There's different weights of uranium, hot stuff, which is good for reactors. It's so hot that it self-propagates and it kind of makes a chain reaction and you've got your nuclear reactor. Now the nuclear reactor, it's all over the world, it doesn't turn into a bomb because you can control the chain reaction. So that's the hot stuff. The other stuff, because you separated out your uranium by centrifuge, is called depleted uranium. It's still radioactive, but not that hot, not great to make a nuclear reactor. So after the years, the decades of enriching uranium, what do you do with the depleted uranium? We don't really know what to do with it until, say, 80 years after they discovered it. Now, you kind of have to learn this if you're going to trap this argument. There's different kind of radiation, alpha, beta, gamma. And then there's some other light radiation, thermal radiation. But as far as what they call ionizing radiation, that means radiation that can change the molecule, change the atom. It can split off the electron and it can make that atom very, very reactive. That's called ionizing radiation. The ones we deal with from our radioactive particles are alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha particles, the bulk of the radiation from uranium or depleted uranium or enriched uranium is alpha. Alpha are big, fat, huge particles. Then there's beta, which is a little smaller, and gamma, which are very small. So an alpha particle, since it's so big, it will be blocked by a piece of paper. So if I took a chunk of uranium, or depleted or not, in front of you, it will not get past your skin. Your skin will block it. It will not get past a piece of paper. A piece of paper will block it. It will not get past three inches of air. Three inches of air will block it. The alpha particle is so big, it hits other stuff and doesn't hit you. 
Well, wait a minute. I thought you said it hit my skin. Skin, actually, if you look very carefully, I'm a physician, is dead material. It doesn't have nuclei. You're afraid that this thing will hit the nuclei, your DNA, and cause mutations. Mutations are bad. They're either going to give you cancer or they're going to give you birth defects if it hits your germ cells. But thank God for the skin. The skin is dead tissue, and underneath it is live, but that first layer of dead tissue, it blocks the alpha. Thank goodness. So that's what we are afraid of, the alpha particles coming out of depleted uranium. So you mean if I got a bowling ball of depleted uranium, and they did this in front of our state legislature, the military did this, theatrics, wasn't it? They put up a chunk of uranium and they said, well, I'm not afraid of that. Well, not only that, but it was in a little plastic bag. The plastic bag is blocking the alpha. I agree. So you're not afraid of uranium chunks, are you? The air will block the radiation. Your skin will block the radiation. So what's the problem? The problem is when you breathe the dust. The dust gets into your lung, and when it's small, five microns, that's a certain size of dust, it really gets into your lung tissue, and there's nothing to block it from the nuclei of your lung tissue in the, in the lung tree. The job is to exchange oxygen to the blood. There's nothing to block the air. You don't have keratin in your lung. And in the lower lung, you don't have mucus. In the upper airways, you have mucus. That's why you cough and blow your nose. But in the lower airway, you cannot have anything to protect the lung tissue from exchanging. So the lung is one area that there's no protection against radiation. So the depleted uranium, when it's in fine dust form, then it goes into your lung. Then you have problems. That's the physics of it. We just challenged, or we were challenged by the military. And the military said that when we blow up depleted uranium, it doesn't generate dust. Well, yes, it does. It doesn't go more than three meters. That's nonsense. That's not the physics I learned. It's real clear. The data is obviously there. When you blow up depleted uranium, it causes a fine dust that can travel thousands of miles in maybe a couple of weeks because the dust is so fine it suspends. It is true. Some of the stuff you blow up bumps along because it's not that fine, and some remain big chunks. But when you blow up depleted uranium, 50% goes up as fine dust for us to breathe. Mercury is heavier than air. When I spill mercury on the ground, we're worried about the mercury vapors. If mercury is heavier than air, why are you worried about the vapors? Because heavy stuff in small particles certainly can travel on the air for great distances. Okay, now time for chemistry. All this stuff, when the NRC tells you, we calculated the risk of uranium and it's very low. Are you talking about uranium dust? I would like to see the calculation on that. Next, depleted uranium versus depleted uranium oxide. That's all the difference in chemistry in the world. Oxide is simply you add oxygen to the depleted uranium. Well, does adding oxygen change anything? Well, H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. H2 is hydrogen. H2O is water. Water is not like hydrogen. Of course it changes things. So where do we add oxygen? How in the world did we add oxygen to our depleted uranium? You blew it up. When you blew it up in the form of weaponry, it burns. Burning means oxidation. And all those little particles that are now ready for you to breathe, they're oxidized depleted uranium oxides, two oxygen, four oxygens, five oxygens, six oxygens. So what's the difference? If I breathe depleted uranium dust versus depleted uranium oxides, all the difference in the world. Depleted uranium, it's polarized, it's water soluble. If I had a choice, I would breathe depleted uranium, metal. What happens to it? It goes in my lung, it's dissolved in the blood, water soluble, and I pee it out maybe in six weeks because my kidney removes the stuff from the blood. Depleted uranium oxide is not water soluble. It's fat soluble. And instead of peeing it out in six weeks like the metal, 
you pee it out in maybe six decades. So it's in your body longer. Well, where does it go? Well, it's in the lymph. The lymph is an archaic, older circulatory system that flows a lot of the water insoluble products. The lymph is responsible for immunity, the white blood cells going around the, lymph, the lymphatics. Well, that's where it is. And that doesn't clear too quickly. Decades instead of weeks. So if you look at the statement by the NRC, I want to see the model that they're dealing with dust and depleted uranium oxides. 